Welcome to Insight. Today we are chatting with David Williams, President and CEO of the Make-A-Wish Foundation. Since 1980, the Make-A-Wish Foundation has granted over 250,000 wishes to children with life-threatening conditions worldwide. David has generously agreed to share some of his experience with us, and I'd like to thank you, David, for joining us today. Thanks, Mark. It's nice to be here. So, to give a wish, to give a wish, I think that is the most astounding concept, and even 30, over 30 years later, to me it is still astounding. Could you talk about the genesis of this idea? Sure. Uh, you know, amazingly, it occurred right down the road, probably less than, less than a half mile away uh, in Phoenix. But in 1980, there was a young boy uh, by the name of Chris Gracious who um, had leukemia. Now, uh, it's interesting. Today, if a child has leukemia, uh, they've got a good shot at, at uh, surviving that illness. But back in 1980, they didn't. But uh, Chris had a favorite TV show. And for uh, your viewers who are a little uh, older, uh, they might remember it, but it was called Chips. And it was about a California motorcycle right. policeman. And, uh, and he loved that show. And he always <laughs> talked about the fact that uh, when he grew up, that's what he wanted to be. Well, as his uh, disease progressed, uh, you know, just a handful of volunteers kind of came together and said, you know, wouldn't it be great if Chris could be a policeman for the day? And so some volunteers got together and they sewed a uniform. They contacted the Arizona Department of Public Safety, uh, who made them a, who made Chris uh, the first and only honorary Arizona State Trooper. Uh, he got to ride in a motorcycle and a helicopter and a, and a police car. He went back uh, to his neighborhood and he wrote tickets. And it was such a great experience, not just for Chris, but for everybody involved that fortunately, um, at the end of it, they all said, you know, we should do this for other kids besides Chris. And, uh, and they did. But that's how Make-A-Wish got started. And that's part of, of his legacy. He's, he's actually the creator of the concept. He is. Uh, his mom, uh, along with four other uh, individuals, are considered our founders. And they are still involved to some extent with the organization. And we're just very blessed that, that they were individuals who, who cared about a broader community uh, than, than just their child. A child, four individuals, and today? Yeah, today uh, we are in, of course, every state in the United States. Uh, a wish is granted uh, somewhere in the world every 32 minutes. Um, we're now in uh, 47 countries. While so many wishes are being granted, it's, uh, I think it's important to remember that you know, it's, it's an individual child each time. And this is a volunteer grassroots organization. Um, over 25,000 volunteers are involved in this work. The vast majority of work is done by volunteers. And I think that's what makes it neat. That's what makes it dynamic and magical. And it's, uh, it's, a, it's a privilege to, to be part of it. And, and so while that is exciting, the part that I think drives us, though, is that while we granted last year close to 14,000 wishes, there are 27,000 kids who are diagnosed with a life-threatening medical condition. So for every child we're helping, there's a child out there that we're not. And I think that's what, that's what drives us. And this is a concept that, that bridges all divides. It, it bridges the divides of culture, of religion, of political affiliation, of, of nationality and nationhood and philosophy. It is really goes, goes to the soul of, of what it is to be a human. It, it absolutely does. And, and I think it gets to the how important uh, hope and, and dreaming um, is for all of us, but especially for a child, especially for a child who is seriously ill. Because when, when that happens, uh, their world turns upside down. I mean, cancer is something that, you know, you think about an old person getting, uh, but not, not a teenager, not, uh, not a, a kid in elementary school. And so when that happens, not only does that child's life turn upside down, but the entire family does, which is why we involve the entire family in a wish. We know that these children, uh, you know, are, are struggling in so many ways. And so for us to be able to come along and say, listen, if you could, if you could wish for anything, you know, what would it be? And now all of a sudden their imagination just, wow, anything? I mean, anything? I could meet anybody or go anywhere or have anything or be anything. And we do all kinds of things to make sure that they think that thing through. Uh, and then to be able to kind of pull it off is, um, 
is pretty amazing. And so it's magical from the very moment that kind of we step into that child's life and then all the anticipation up to that wish experience, the wish itself, and then even after, uh, you know, the memories that are, that are created. Uh, I think some of the most poignant conversations I've ever had have been with adults who had a wish granted 15 years ago and to hear them talk about what that experience still means to them today, how it influenced their life, how it influenced their career, how it influenced how they parent, uh, how they, you know, just how they live. It's something that is, uh, is truly amazing. So it's not a, it's not a nice to have kind of neat um, experience. It's actually much more profound than, um, than sometimes uh, we think it is. So talk about how this organization functions as a whole. It, it is very difficult to set up a nonprofit, make it self-sustaining. Certainly one that has been self-sustaining for over 30 years is a difficult thing to pull off. And then to also have broken the bounds of, of nation, um, custom, and so on. Uh, how does this this organization communicate even with, with its various constituents? Right. Well, uh, like many organizations out there, we're a federation. And so kind of going back to the beginning, uh, Make-A-Wish was very fortunate to get some great national publicity. And as a result, uh, a lot of people kind of raised their hand and said, well, we'd like to do Make-A-Wish in our community. And so that happened. And, and in fact, over 30 chapters were kind of informally established before they decided to have a national organization to kind of coordinate things and set national policy and raise money nationally and globally. So it starts off with the, this sort of grassroots exactly. people grasping onto this very powerful idea and you're already from here in Phoenix communicating these ideas and how did, how did you make it work? That's exactly right. And, and that's still very true today from the standpoint that uh, you know, this mission is carried out locally. Now, we do a lot of things nationally in terms of, you know, our branding efforts, our national fundraising. We have some amazing uh, corporate sponsors. We raise money like most other nonprofit organizations online, direct mail, plain giving, all those kind of things we do. But at its heart, uh, Make-A-Wish is, is a volunteer-led grassroots organization. And so, you know, each of these chapters that we have uh, have a local board of directors that governs that organization. Um, they have a staff led by a CEO that um, that runs the day-to-day operate, -day operations. They raise money locally and uh, and spend the money locally. And I think, you know, usually people like that. And when money can benefit their neighborhood, their city, their state, uh, and that it can be pretty tangible. And I think that that's one of the things that we see as well is that, uh, you know, a lot of our donors actually meet the families and they're able to hear from them what that wish experience was like. And that's, um, you know, that, that's pretty neat. We don't always get to, to do that. When we make donations, a lot of times we make investments uh, into the future or, or to help people in, in other parts of the world. And so to actually see uh, an individual and, uh, who, who was uh, helped by you know, by your gift is, uh, is a pretty neat thing. So the, the funds that are raised by the national organization go into the overarching context. So it's the, it's the website, um, it is the branding that you do, uh, some materials uh, that, that you share amongst your, your various members. Um, do you also provide technical assistance to uh, chapters that, that are starting or that, or that require some support? Absolutely. And, and in fact, you know, the vast majority of the money that we raise uh, actually gets distributed to those chapters. And so we'll distribute annually, annually about $40 million uh, that, is, uh, that is raised nationally. But, you know, the truth of the matter is, is that most donors, whether it's a corporation or an individual, um, they want to see that money go to the, to the mission of the organization. And in our case, they want to see wishes granted. Right. And so while everybody understands you've got to do these things in order to run the business, uh, you know, we want to be able to do that as well. And so while we provide technical expertise and, and branding and raise money and all those kind of things, uh, we really work at, at being able to, to distribute that money uh, to local chapters so that they can make things happen. And when you look at the, your, your 14,000 wishes uh, every year, how do you measure your success? Is it by 
the number of wishes that, that, that are granted? Is it that simple? Uh, to some extent, it is. Um, we, every year in our history, we've granted more wishes than the year before. And, and that was even during some pretty, you know, 2008 to, through really now. It's, that, it's, been, it's been a challenge. It's been so that is one measure. I would say it's the primary measure. Uh, that's why people support us. It's, it's our ultimate metric. And having said that, we also have other metrics as well that, you know, we think are important. And they are around good governance, uh, protecting the brand, um, you know, how much we spend on program versus fundraising versus administration. Uh, you know, we just received an award uh, a little bit ago from, a, uh, from the Nonprofit Times as being one of the best nonprofit workplaces in which to, uh, in which to work. And, you know, I, I, I think that if, if we take care of those types of things, they will ultimately result in us being able to grant more wishes because, you know, if we have a great workplace, for example, well, people will stay longer. There is less turnover. I think that, uh, that folks that, that are happy and passionate and want to be where they work will do a better job. But to answer your question, the ultimate metric for us is, is wishes granted. Yeah. How many people are, are with the national organization? So we have about 110, and uh, the majority of them are here in Phoenix, uh, but we also have folks that are scattered uh, throughout the United States. And then our chapters have about 800 employees, okay. uh, again, throughout the United States. So a total organization of about 900, and 900 to 950 uh, exactly. individuals. And in terms of helping the chapters, are, do you create a template for a chapter that you then deploy, or do you have like three templates, a, a chapters for large urban areas versus um, or uh, areas where there might be you know, geographic distance that is uh, involved? Yeah, one of the interesting things, when I had mentioned about 30 chapters mm -hmm. uh, starting before there was even a national organization, uh, of course, the benefit of that was you had great enthusiasm and uh, local uh, autonomy and, and right. empowerment, absolutely. The one downside was that, uh, you know, if we were going to just start with a blank sheet of paper today, uh, we might not have structured it the same way. And so in some cases, we have a chapter that encompasses three entire states. And then in other instances, we have a chapter that maybe encompasses a city. Um, we have some chapters that we, we have some states that have five chapters in them, five or six, and then others that uh, it's just one state. And so, you know, I think there's a little bit of a of a very organic uh, type of organization that we have that we you know we're still working through. And uh, we've had as many as 84 chapters. We're now at 62. Uh, but again, we we just try to. Uh, there's no secret map or master plan. Uh, we, it, uh, from our, our belief is that it's all about people and having the right people in the right uh, places and being able to help an organization, whether it's a $500,000 chapter in the Rio Grande Valley or a $10 million chapter in New York City, to help them be effective, to be able to grant the uh, great wishes and the number of wishes given the population that they have. And some of our very best chapters are some of our smallest ones. What kind of formula do you use to distribute the means that you, that you have nationally amongst these very different organizations uh, under, op, operating under a single umbrella with very different needs? A lot of the money that we'll distribute will be, well, first of all, uh, designated by the donor. Uh, donor designation is absolutely key. And if somebody says, I want this, uh, I want my gift to go to the Grand Wish in Georgia, well, then that's where it's going to go. And we'll see that on an individual basis. We'll also see that on a corporate basis where um, with a lot of our cause-related marketing uh, mm -hmm. programs, for example, uh, what we want to do is incent the chapters who, who make it happen. And so uh, our biggest cash supporter is Macy's, and they have stores all throughout the country. And there's a lot of work that our chapters have to uh, put forth to make that program work. And so that money will be distributed based on the number of stores and how successful that promotion is locally. And so that's an incentive for everybody to, to get after it and, uh, and, and make that happen. Now, at the same time, we also have undesignated funds that come in nationally that then we use in a strategic manner where 
uh, you know, this past year, we've uh, had a drop in frequent flyer miles. We're one of the, I think, one of the few charities out there that need frequent flyer miles. Uh, Seventy percent of all of our wishes involve travel. So as airlines and others have become much more uh, imaginative and, um, and aggressive in terms of here are different ways you can use those miles, uh, some people will donate less to us. Well, that impacts our, you know, our chapters. And so we've been uh, trying to help our chapters uh, have campaigns for frequent flyer miles, to do things uh, online with friends and family and, and things like that. And so we'll use uh, some of the undesignated money that we have to encourage uh, chapters to do things that we think are, are smart to do long term. And so if we can help a chapter uh, maybe hire a person uh, a plane giving officer, a major gift officer, uh, a VP of development, then uh, that we know that that's, that's a good thing to do long term. And if we can help make that hiring decision a little bit easier, because, you know, boards are typically reluctant to add headcount. Right. Um, so if we can make that uh, decision a little bit easier by, by subsidizing that a little bit, then, uh, then we'll do that. Now, you also have quite a few volunteers that are attached to these 950 uh, staff in your various organizations. Yes. We have about 25,000 volunteers uh, worldwide that are involved in either uh, uh, fundraising, uh, governance, wish granting is a, is a very big area where, where volunteers are involved. And so, uh, you know, I think wh where it really comes down to the, to the carrying out of the mission, uh, it's being done most of the time by volunteers. And to me, that's a very exciting thing. Volunteers bring a dynamic that is uh, uh, that is contagious, and um, and a lot of times those volunteers become donors, and they become you know board members, and you know a lot of very very good things uh, happen as a result of volunteer engagement. So we try to do everything we can uh, to encourage uh, more volunteer involvement. Describe the international arc of of the organization, in particular. How do how many chapters are there in places like um, like the Asia region, uh, Europe, Middle East, Africa? Right. So uh, international work really got started uh, fairly soon uh, after the after it started in the United States, but primarily in Canada. 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 Canada was the first national organization, and then it um, you know UK, New Zealand, Australia uh, were some of the the first uh, uh, international affiliates. We have an organization uh, called the Make-A-Wish Foundation International that works on wish granting and the work of Make-A-Wish throughout the, throughout the world. So uh, unlike in the United States, where we've been around for 32 years, uh, you know, we have a number of countries that have been around for a couple years or five years. So it's a very, very different organization. The brand is not as well known. Um, you know, a lot of countries don't necessarily have the culture of philanthropy that we're so blessed with uh, here in the United States. Uh, and so it's a little bit of a different picture. Make-A-Wish is not as big, uh, say, in Africa. Um, it is uh, uh, much stronger in Europe and Asia and in South America. I would say those are the three big areas. But I would say that it has, uh, it has really been picking up steam. And it's, been, and it's been neat to see that, and you mentioned this earlier, that despite different cultures, despite uh, different socioeconomic backgrounds, despite different religions, you know, despite all these differences, joy and the hope and the strength uh, for that, not just for that child, but for the entire family, is, uh, is still as magical and, and remarkable, regardless of where somebody lives. It's very interesting to get to a point where you're leading a very unique organization. There's no other organization like Make-A-Wish. But there are organizations whose, organiza whose operating model um, has some touch points. So you're the chief operating officer for Habitat Hero for Humanity for 11 years after recovering a almost failed food bank in Houston. Yeah, I was in over my head uh -huh. twice. Okay. Um, but it was, uh, actually this current job is, is really the only one that I feel like I, when I came into it, I was, uh, I was somewhat you know, somewhat qualified for. And, and one of the reasons was because uh, one of the challenges that Make-A-Wish had at the time 
was kind of the relationship between chapters and the, and right. the headquarters operation. Made some really critical governance changes that allowed me to, when I came on board, to be able to help propel the, the organization forward. Um, but, I, you know, one of the good things was that I had had experience on both sides of, the, of that federated fence. When I was with the Houston Food Bank, we belonged to, the, to what was then called Second Harvest. But it was 200 food banks throughout the United States. So right. we were one of 200 food banks. And uh, so I knew what it was like to deal with a, with a national organization. And in Habitat for Humanity, I was on the flip side where we had 1,700 affiliates throughout the United States and all over the world. And so I was kind of on that side of the fence. So I, so I felt like I knew what it was like to be in that federated world because that's what I'd been doing for 22 years. So I think that was helpful to be able to come into this role and say, look, whether you're a chapter CEO or whether you're here at the national office, I, I think I have a sense of, you know, what your world is like. And, you know, we need to work together. We need to, we need to be one organization, even though we're 62 organizations. Right. But we need to start thinking and, and acting and caring for each other as if we're one organization. Because you know what? In the mind of the public, we are one organization. Are one organization. People don't care how many chapters there are. I mean, they really don't. They just care about our mission. You know, do they delight in our mission or not? Do they, well, they think care we're about well the wish? That's right. They, they care, care about, about the, the wish. wish. They That's care exactly about right. the person. They care about the wish. That's right. So, what's next for the Make a Wish Foundation? What What does the future hold for the next five and ten years? Our vision at Make a Wish is that every eligible child would be able to receive a wish. Well, there are fourteen thousand kids who right now we're helping, there are 27,000 who are eligible. So, and we're a $250 million organization. So that means we'd have to, you know, close to double in size. So that's, you know, a four to $500 million organization. Well, you know what? That's possible. I mean, we have one of the strongest brands, certainly in the United States. And so, you know, I think we have a vision that's attainable. We have to get the right leaders in place who who can help make that happen. We have to be able to raise the, the resources. We have to have the right outreach to, you know, to find the, those kids and make those wishes occur. But it's a vision that is possible. And it's the balance between the, um, the aggressiveness on a local level, somebody who drives, but also the cohesion on a national and international level. So you have leaders who you want to be aspirational, you want to be ambitious, uh, ambitious, but with the values to allow them to cooperate uh, with others, even as they're trying to ambitiously raise the funds to to double their uh, wish granting capability. Yeah, you're exactly right, and that's why these CEO positions are so hard right. uh, because you have to be strategic, you have to be a fundraiser, you have to be collaborative. And, um, and you have a lot of stakeholders, uh, you know, volunteers, donors, staff, the board, the general public. Um, and it, these, are, these are really tough jobs. And frankly, we've seen a fair amount of turnover in, in these positions the last few years. And we've kind of made some steps to try to be more involved in that selection process, uh, to involve some of our neighboring chapters uh, in that selection process. Because if you get it right, then, you know, a lot can flow from that. Uh, the right CEO will make sure that you have the right staff. The right CEO will, will make sure that you have the right board governing the organization. Um, so it's a, uh, it's a critical position, and it's a very hard one. And I think that, you know, the one thing about the nonprofit sector that I've observed is that, um, you know, we have we have somebody right now who used to be uh, our national board chair, used to be the CEO of a of a, of a big for profit corporation, who retired uh, early retirement, but uh, came to work for Make a Wish as the CEO of two different chapters. And what I found interesting was that her comment after completing both interim assignments was that she said they were absolutely the toughest professional roles she ever had in her life. Now, this is somebody who is a CEO right. of a big for-profit business all around the country. And I don't think people have an appreciation for, um, for the subtleties and, um, and, and just the challenges uh, 
that that uh, nonprofit CEOs have. You know, you can do a lot if you, if you've got a big bank account and you can pay for a lot of stuff, and uh, and you have a one customer that you have to deal with or a set of, of customers. Then, then that's one thing, but it's, it's a very much different world. One, one indicator of success. If right. You, if you that's generate right. margin, you're successful, and and that covers a lot of ground. Right. Whereas in the nonprofit sphere, um, you do have to end up with a positive balance in your bank accounts to continue operating. Right. But beyond that, you have to think about values. You have to think about behaviors. You have to think about how people feel. Uh, in interacting with your organization, that's right. Um, and you cannot buy the talent uh, because well, that's right. That's the people also, who are right. properly motivated aren't for purchase. Right. They they want to have a certain experience. And they want to they want to give in a certain way. That's right. It's a very challenging uh, uh, act. What I also think is very interesting, and I I laud you for it, is that you are as an organization, self-motivated to grow. You talked with a great deal of pride about every year um, delivering more wishes than you have in, a pre in the previous year. It is, it is really a, a, an ambition that's embedded within your culture. Um, and, and that is an ambition of, of being unafraid about meeting the challenges that growth imposes on the organization. You can't be in this nonprofit work without wanting to help other people. Just Make to, tomorrow better than today. Absolutely right. And so uh, now, you know, you, but you have to be able to grow in the right way. And you, I mean, our quality, uh, the, the, I mean, we could probably grant more wishes and then just start saying, right. uh, listen, that, uh, you know, we've been doing those limousine rides to the airport. You know, let's cut that out. We've been sending kids on these uh, trips to Disney World for uh, five days, let's make it three days. I mean, there are things that you can do that uh, that organizations do all the time. For profit, non profit, it doesn't matter. And it's something that we talk about all the time. Is that you know what makes our organization, I think, uh, unique is that we constantly try to exceed expectations. Just when that child and that family thinks this experience couldn't be any better something else happens. I can't tell you the number of families that I've met where no matter what the wish was, if it involved travel, they were taking a limousine ride to the airport and it's the limousine ride that they're talking about. They had never ridden in a limousine before. And it'd be so easy to say, hey, you know what, you get a cab and uh, you know that's the way you're going to get to the airport. But it's just something that we think is important that from beginning to end, we're going to try to make this an experience that that family is never going to forget. And it's not always just about money because, again, our volunteers ask a lot of questions to find out, you know, what are those things that are really special uh, to that kid? What are the things that they like? And what are their favorite colors? And what are their favorite games? And what are the, and so it's, it's just something that, again, you have to, you want to be about uh, ins inspiring these kids and these families because the, the reality is is that when you get to meet them uh, they're the ones that really inspire you I mean I, the, the courage that these kids have and uh, and what these parents are going through and the positive attitude no matter kind of what the hand that life has uh, has dealt them is is a pretty tough one and there are some pretty amazing individuals out there so it's um, uh, yeah, we're in the inspiration business, but I think we tend to be the ones that uh, get inspired because we get that question a lot. I'll get that question a lot. Gosh, you know, you're around these kids that are sick. Isn't that depressing? Or, you know, how can you do that? And my goodness, it's not at all because, you know, we're trying to bring some joy into these lives. And, uh, and in fact, they bring joy into our lives. David Williams, thank you so much for making so many wishes come true, and thank you for your insights. Thank you, Mark. It was a pleasure to be here. Thank you.